you know, the allure of finding a consistent edge in trading, it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. That idea of capturing reliable returns, understanding the market. It is. But let's be real, predicting those market movements, that's the hard part. Absolutely. That's mm -hmm. why stories like Richard Dennis and the Turtle Traders, you know, successfully following trends systematically, they're just so compelling. Makes you wonder, can you really codify an edge? It certainly does. And that leads us right into our focus today. We're looking at a specific, potentially very fast trend following strategy designed for NQ futures. Okay, NQ futures. Speed. Yeah. And we've got some material outlining the strategy, a pretty novel indicator it uses, some experimental results, and crucially, the potential sticking points. Right. So this is a proper deep dive. We want to get into the nuts and bolts. What's the thinking behind it? How does it actually work? And what did the performance look like? The good, the bad, the maybe tricky part? Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Any trend following system, it really boils down to a couple of key components, doesn't it? Precisely. You need your entry trigger, when do you jump in, long or short. And you need your exit trigger, when do you get out, take profit, or cut your losses. And usually you see things like price breaking above a moving average or maybe busting out of a channel. That's the typical signal. That's the classic approach, yeah. Breakouts, moving average, crossovers. But this strategy we're digging into, it takes a different route, especially for those signals. It uses something called Kalman filters. Kalman filters. Okay, that sounds a bit more complex than a simple moving average. What's the advantage there? Why go that route? Well, the interesting thing about Kalman filters is they're specifically designed to be better at filtering out noise. You know all those random jitters you see on a price chart, especially short term? Oh yeah, the constant static. Exactly. The common filter tries to smooth that static out, reveal the underlying trend, the real signal. Plus, they can adapt to changing market conditions better than a fixed average. They're more dynamic. Okay, so filtering noise, adapting, sounds useful. But how does it actually do that? You hear about estimating the state of a system. What does that mean in terms of, say, NQ futures prices? Think of it like, your phone's GPS trying to figure out where you are. It gets noisy signals, right? But it also uses your past movement, your speed, its internal model of how things move. Right, it combines the messy real world data with a prediction. Precisely. The common filter does something similar for price. It takes the observed closing price, that's the messy data, and combines it with a model of how price and its trend are likely to behave. And it keeps updating its best guess with every new price bar. So the state it's trying to nail down is both the current price and the trend, the direction it's moving. Exactly, price and trend. And it uses a few key parts. There's a model for how price and trend usually change from one minute to the next. Like new price equals old price plus trend. That's the state transition. Okay. Then there's the measurement part, basically acknowledging the closing price we see is our main clue to the true price. And then these covariances, process noise, measurement noise, sounds like how much it trusts its own model versus the actual price it sees. You got it. Especially that measurement noise, often called R. That's key. Think of R as how much the filter thinks the incoming price data might just be random noise. So a low R means the filter really trusts the price data. It reacts fast to every little wiggle. Good for catching quick moves maybe, but you might get faked out a lot. The line would look really choppy. Jumpy. Reactive. Right. Now, a high R means the filter is skeptical about the price data. It thinks it's noisy. So it leans more on its internal trend model. That gives you a much smoother output. But potentially slower to react. It might lag. Exactly. It could miss the turn because it's smoothing things out so much. Finding that sweet spot for R is pretty important. Okay, that makes sense. So this strategy uses two Kalman filters. One fast with a low R and one slow with a high R. Yes. And that leads directly to this QT indicator, the quantitativo trend indicator. And how does that work? How do you combine the fast and slow filters? 
It's actually quite elegant in its simplicity. The QT indicator or QTI is just the percentage difference between the output of the fast filter and the output of the slow filter. Oh, OK. So it measures how far the fast reacting price estimate has moved away from the slower, smoother trend estimate. Precisely. And then they scale this percentage difference to a range from minus 100 to plus 100. What do those extremes mean? Think of plus 100 as a point where the fast price is historically stretched the furthest above the slow trend, and negative 100 is the furthest below. Zero just means they're pretty much aligned. Okay, so how does that translate into actual trade signals for NQ? What are the rules? The rules described are quite straightforward. For going long, you enter when the QTI crosses above plus 5. Okay, plus 5 entry. Your profit target is when the QTI hits plus 35, and the stop loss. If it drops back down to your entry point, plus 5. Got it. Take profit at plus 35, stop out back at entry. What about shorts? For shorts, the entry trigger is the QTI crossing below negative 90. Minus 90. Seems quite far down. It does. The profit target is set just a bit lower at negative 95. And the stop loss, again, is back at the entry point, negative 90. Interesting asymmetry there between the long and short levels. And it's always in or out, right? Yes. The setup described is either 100% long, 100% short, or flat. No scaling in or out with multiple contracts in this basic version. OK, clear rules. Now, the source material dives into some back testing. NQ futures, one minute bars, going back to mid-2017. That's right, trading around the clock using closing prices of those one-minute bars. And importantly, this initial test used Forex leverage but didn't factor in trading costs like commissions or slippage. The assumption was NQ is liquid enough, maybe? We'll come back to that assumption. But first, what did those initial results look like? Pretty compelling, actually. The annual return was reported around 29.7%, which was almost double the NQ benchmark's 15% over that same period. Wow, okay, double the benchmark. It showed positive returns in all years tested, except for one year that was basically flat, around zero. And risk? Drawdown. Sharp ratio. The maximum drawdown was lower than the benchmark 26% versus 35% for just holding NQ, and the sharp ratio measuring risk-adjusted return came in at 1.19, much better than the benchmark's 0.77. Okay, higher return, lower drawdown, better sharp. What about trade frequency and win rate? High frequency, about 3,972 trades per year, which works out to roughly 16 trades a day. 16 trades a day. The win rate was just under 50% at 48.5%, but the profit factor was positive, 1.07, meaning the average win was slightly larger than the average loss, and the payoff ratio was 1.11. So slightly less than half the trades win, but the wins are bigger than the losses on average. Makes sense. Now, they didn't stop there, right? They tried to optimize those QTI entry and exit levels. Exactly. They took the data up to the end of 2021 as their in-sample period to test a whole range of different QTI values for entries and exits. Trying to find the magic numbers. Kind of. They tested long entries between 1 and 10, exits between 30 and 40, short entries from negative 85 down to 987, and exits from negative 87 to negative 99. And then they tested the best findings on data after 2021, the out-of-sample test. Yes, from 2022 onwards. That's the crucial validation part. And they did something interesting. Instead of picking just one best parameter set, they created a portfolio of the top 10 sets found in sample, weighted to maximize the sharp ratio. A portfolio approach to parameters. Okay, how did that perform out of sample in the real validation period? It held up quite well. The annualized return since January 2022 was reported at 27.7%. Still very strong. How did the benchmark do in that period? The NQ benchmark only managed about 6.5% annualized returns since Jan 2022. So significant outperformance continued. And the risk metrics for the optimized portfolio. Even better on the drawdown front. Maximum drawdown out of sample was just 13.5% compared to NQ's 35%. The sharp ratio remains strong at 1.17. Again, much higher than the benchmark's 0.40 for that period. Lower drawdown, strong, sharp, continued outperformance. Any other stats? Monthly performance. Yeah, some encouraging signs there too. Only positive years since 2022 began. About 76% of the months were positive. The best month showed an 11.2% gain. And the worst. The worst month was down 8.5%. But interestingly, they noted there were no two consecutive losing months recorded in that out of sample period. No back to back losing months. That sounds good psychologically. Okay, so the back tests, both initial and optimized, look impressive on paper, but 
There's always a but, isn't there? Always. And the source material itself brings this up in its final thoughts. This is where we hit the practical realities. Especially with a strategy trading 16 times a day on a one minute chart. Exactly. The execution challenge is significant. Your trading platform, your data feed, your connection, everything needs to be incredibly fast and reliable. Even tiny delays, milliseconds can cause slippage. Slippage meaning you don't get the price you expected when your order hits the market. Right. And with so many trades, even small amounts of slippage on each one can seriously erode profits compared to the perfect backtest scenario. You absolutely need to nail the execution algorithm. And that brings us back to trading cost commissions and that slippage we just talked about. The initial backtest didn't include them. Correct. And while NQ is very liquid with tight spreads, it's not free to trade. A comment mentioned in the source rightly points out that trend-following strategies, especially high-frequency ones, often look fantastic before you factor in costs. Yeah, nearly 4,000 trades a year. Even if the cost per trade is tiny, multiplying it by 4,000. That's going to have a real impact on the bottom line. A potentially huge impact. It's probably the single biggest question mark hanging over these results. What do they look like after realistic transaction costs are deducted? Did the source suggest ways to potentially improve or further test this? It did. Some logical next steps were mentioned, like diversifying the system across other futures markets, not just NQ. See if it works elsewhere. Testing different time frames, maybe not just one minute bars, and exploring even more variations of those Kalman filter noise parameters, the R values we talked about. Maybe there's a better balance to be found. Okay, so lots of potential avenues for more research. Let's try and wrap this up then. We've looked at this pretty intriguing, fast, trend-following idea for NQ. Built around using those two common filters, one fast, one slow, to create that QT indicator. Which gives simple, quantifiable entry and exit rules. And the back tests, well, they showed some really eye-catching potential, didn't they? Strong returns, good risk metrics, both initially and after optimization. And the theory behind using Kalman filters makes sense, that idea of cutting through market noise and adapting to changing conditions to spot trends earlier or more reliably than traditional methods. But, and it's big but, we absolutely have to temper that with the practical realities. The high frequency means execution is critical. Absolutely. Slippage in commissions could significantly eat into those back-tested profits. What looks great in theory or a cost-free simulation might be much harder to achieve in live trading. It really highlights that gap that can exist between a strategy on paper and its real-world performance. Which leaves us, and you listening, with a key thought. We've seen the theoretical appeal and the promising numbers from the back tests. But how much of that potential survives the real-world friction of high-frequency execution and transaction costs? It's that constant tension in trading, isn't it? Balancing the hunt for alpha against the unavoidable costs of playing the game. 